In this lesson, we'll consider how sleep may be an important component of memory consolidation processes. In other words, that sleep has a memory function. We'll look at uh, a, a current hypothesis regarding uh, how sleep plays this role and some supporting evidence. But first, some background on sleep. Sleep is widespread in the animal kingdom, and the fact that it is widespread suggests from an evolutionary point of view that it has some kind of adaptive survival value. Um, and in addition, sleep carries with it a, a significant cost to the individual. So when an animal goes to sleep, they become unconscious, and consequently they are more vulnerable to predators or other environmental threats. So the fact that sleep carries with it such a cost again suggests that there must be some counterbalancing uh, survival value. Uh, and another piece of evidence that sleep is uh, uh, must be doing something positive for the animal has to do with the nature of how marine mammals sleep. And to understand this down here, we're going to have to first take a look at uh, some basic EEG data for the different stages of sleep in a typical mammal. So uh, here is the awake mammal, so this could be a person here, and if you record the electrical activity of the surface of the brain, the cortex, you'll see these kind of low amplitude, sort of uh, high frequency signals here, characteristic of being awake. As we enter sleep, uh, researchers have sort of divided this into different stages, but you'll notice the EEG pattern uh, becomes different. So the brain seems to be entering into different modes of processing. Stage 4 sleep here, and this would be non-REM sleep, has these high amplitude, right, low frequency waves. Uh, and then here we see the REM sleep. Now this used to be associated with dream sleep, but we now know dreaming does occur in non-REM sleep as well. REM stood for rapid eye movement sleep. And here we lose the muscle tone uh, so that we don't act out right, our dreams. Now, okay, so this is the EE pattern of a one cycle of sleep. Now, we would go through this cycle uh, several times during the night. Well, what's interesting, if we recall the uh, stage four here, uh, non-REM sleep here, a deep stage of sleep and, and take a look at the waking or stage one EEG pattern here. Take a look at what's happening in a marine mammal. Remember marine mammals have to uh, surface to breathe, right? And so if, their entire, if the entire brain entered into sleep mode, that would pose a challenge to, uh, to surviving in an aquatic environment. Well, here we have the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere and the EEG patterns for uh, the right and the left at different stages of sleep. Take a look here at stage three sleep. What we've got here is the right hemisphere seems to be in a deep stage for sleep here, but the left hemisphere is in a different stage, right? So it's a different mode of processing. And in fact, sometime later, the hemispheres switch. It's as if for these marine mammals, they are sleeping one hemisphere at a time, leaving the other hemisphere in, in a mode that will be responsive to the environment. Right, so the fact that, that marine mammals have gone to such evolutionary lengths right, to maintain a period of sleep suggests that sleep is serving some kind of important function. And in this lesson, we'll, we'll take a look at its role in memory function. Now, the hypothesis that we'll take a look at is called the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, uh, presented by Professor Tononi and his colleagues. Um, Tononi is going to argue that sleep is the price we pay for plasticity when awake. In other words, if we're going to have a brain that can learn when we're awake, right, synaptic plasticity, that synapses can respond with LTP and to, and to strengthen neural connections that can in encode experiences and then and remember that if we're going to have brains that can be uh, be responsive to learning episodes, sleep is going to be a required physiological process to maintain this plasticity on successive days, right? So that's going to be the, the idea here that brains that are equipped with the capacity to learn are going to have to have some kind of mode of processing that we identify as sleep in order to maintain that learning capacity. 
Now in this diagram here again we have sort of like the different stages of, of sleep. So we have awake and then slow wave sleep and REM and then back to another slow wave sleep and recall that we'll go through several cycles uh, on, on a particular evening. Uh, but below each uh, stage here then we have a brain and then here's the hippocampus here. And so what we'll be doing is taking a look at the, the mode of processing, information processing going on at these different stages. And Tononi and his colleagues are going to argue that what's happening during sleep is that synapses that were strengthened during the waking stage as a result of learning, right? Those synapses that were strengthened are going to take part in a memory consolidation process to transform, uh, transfer memories up to the cortex, but then undergo a weakening process so that the uh, learning system can be ready to learn new things. So that's the big picture, that going through these stages of sleep is necessary in order to uh, consolidate memories and reset the brain so that it can learn again the next day. Now let's uh, take a look in more detail what's going on in these stages. Okay, let's consider the waking stage here. So we've already learned that when we are seeing things and hearing things and feeling things and so on, all of that uh, sensory and perceptual information is fed down into the hippocampus. So it all converges in the hippocampus where uh, hippocampal synapses will undergo LTP, uh, sort of linking together those different aspects of our ongoing experience, forming a memory, uh, so to speak, right, in the hippocampal system. Now. Uh, Tononi's point is is that it takes a significant, uh, first of all, significant cellular metabolic resources to, to do LTP, right? Cells have to um, uh, produce proteins, they have to generate energy to grow synapses and so on and, and strengthen synapses. Uh, and that, that is a metabolic cost. So right away, learning has significant metabolic costs. But in addition, we've also encountered evidence that um, the hippocampal system is a limited learning system, right? So we've seen that uh, new learning can interfere with pr previous recently learned information. And remember, LTP has that window of consolidation and that new learning seems to interfere with previous LTP. Um, uh, and furthermore, new neurons, right, are constantly born into the hippocampus. Again, sort of uh, interfering with the memories stored in the hippocampal system. And those were reasons why we said system consolidation made sense, get the memories out of the hippocampal system. Um, Tononi is going to now uh, take a, a, a another a look at that uh, situation and suggest that, that if you think about just LTP, as we learn things uh, over the course of the day, synapses are getting stronger, but they couldn't keep on getting stronger, right? There has to be some kind of maximum limit to the amount of synaptic strengthening you can do. And if, if these synapses just stayed strong uh, and then just always got stronger and stronger every time we learned something, there would be some kind of ceiling effect. We're going to call that the danger of synaptic saturation. That at a certain point, you just can't make your synapses any stronger. And if at that point, then, the system cannot learn anything new because the synapses would not be able to respond by increasing their strength. So we're going to call that danger of synaptic saturation. And it suggests right away, then, from this point of view, that to have a brain that can learn by strengthening synapses, you're going to have to have a way to reduce the strength of those synapses so they can learn again on another day, right? So the LTP that happens during waking stage here, that does um, uh, allow us to learn events for that day. But Tononi is going to argue uh, you're going to have to weaken those synapses at some point so that new learning can occur on the following day. Now let's take a look at what happens in slow wave sleep. So let's say we've had our experiences here. Now, notice uh, there are a couple of uh, synapses here in red. Let's say that during that episode that we were learning, those particular synapses uh, really carried some important information, some important event was happening. And those synapses were the ones that were strengthened as a result of that important experience. Now, these other synapses here, the black ones here, they also might have uh, uh, enjoyed some LTP as a result of learning something else. But we're going to say that that something else wasn't really very important. Right, so the ones in red, w that those synapses got strengthened because, um, uh, or uh, as a consequence of some important event. Now, uh, Tononi and others argue that during slow wave sleep, something very interesting happens 
um, uh, to the hippocampus. Hippocampal cells begin to fire in rapid bursts, sending signals up to the cortex. And the idea is, is that this is what system consolidation really is. It's the hippocampal cells that were activated, right, that were, that it enjoyed LTP in, during the learning stage of our waking life. Those same hippocampal cells are now going to send signals up to the cortex, creating a situation where cortical cells here can form a memory of, uh, of the learning event that happened that day. So we're going to have LTP going on here up in the cortex as well, and it's the hippocampal cells firing in just that pattern that they were activated during the original learning. They're going to be uh, creating the cortical memory up here, or consolidating that uh, memory up into the cortex. Now, notice though, it's the it's the red ones here having sort of a preferential treatment here, right? So uh, the idea is is that synapses that might have undergone LTP, but for kind of not important information, it was just a, an incidental event that happened during the day, it's not worthy of remembering, um, that those synapses aren't going to get as much sort of system consolidation activity, right? And researchers are still trying to find, uh, figure out how is it that uh, the cells that encode important information are the ones that, that are going to be um, doing most of the system consolidation. So more research needs to, to be done on that topic. But we're going to suggest that this is a, a, we can describe this as a kind of a replay of the learning episode. And this is happening during slow wave sleep that the hippocampus is going to replay those uh, uh, memories uh, from uh, the waking experience. It's offline because the person is unconscious now, right? And now that kind of makes sense because we wouldn't want to have ongoing perceptions interfere with this memory processing here. You'll recall when a memory is reactivated, it must be reconsolidated and other new information can can be integrated into that uh, memory. Uh, so what you want to do then from a, a theoretical point of view, when you're consolidating memory, you want to shut down your perceptual systems. And sure enough, uh, we are shut down. We are unconscious during slow wave sleep. So the fact that we're unconscious during sleep turns out to be sort of an important uh, part of the story. There's a purpose to the fact that that or to why we're unconscious. It limits interference from ongoing perception as we do this important memory consolidation. Now, what's the evidence for this replay? Uh, it, it comes in the form of rodent experiments and some other types of experiments, but let's imagine a, a rat is sort of, you know, running a maze. It's learning to navigate some kind of maze. And what the researchers will do is, is record from several hippocampal cells uh, in, the, in the rat as it uh, goes through the maze. And sure enough, when the rat is in a certain location, a particular hippocampal cell will fire. And then when it gets to another location, a different hippocampal cell will fire. And then it gets to a third location, a different hippocampal cell will fire. So they can, they can record the pattern of hippocampal cell activity as the rat is learning. Well, then what they find is during sleep, you find the same kind of pattern of hippocampal cell activity during sleep. It's as if um, the, the brain is reprocessing what it learned uh, uh, during waking, right? Um, so we're going to call that the replay function here. And now we're, we're getting a handle on exactly what we mean by system consolidation. It is literally the hippocampal cells sending electrical signals right up to the cortex in the same pattern as when activated uh, during the learning so that a memory of that event can be stored in the cortical system. Of course, LTP has to be happening up here for those synapses to be strengthened as well. Now, one last thing about the slow wave sleep here, you'll notice you have these uh, large amplitude, low frequency uh, EEG uh, recordings here. And the idea is, is that uh, neurons all over the cortex, they seem to be kind of um, organized into patterns of firing. So during the, the peak here, you'll have a local population of neurons firing uh, high, frequen high frequency bursts, and then they remain quiet for a time. And then uh, they'll fire again and then they'll remain quiet, and then they'll fire again. So 
uh, what's driving this seems to be brainstem systems are are creating this cortical kind of pattern of cells fire at some time and then they stay quiet for a little bit and then they fire again and that's what we're recording uh, in the uh, EEG pattern during this process so that's what's happening at the in the cortex here but at these um, at these peaks where neurons in the cortex are firing right they are responding to the hippocampal system and it's and that's uh, precisely what you would expect for LTP high frequency signals coming up from the hippocampus during these moments when the cortical cells are are responding a lot with uh, their own action potentials and so those synapses will be potentiated okay so now let's look at the next stage REM stage rapid eye movement stage here um, and you'll recall that's associated with uh, certain kinds of dreams and the the visual experiences the weird visual and auditory experiences that we have and this is thought to be generated by brainstem neurons sending random signals up to the cortex in a way then that the cortex in a sense tries to make sense of them and so we get the bizarre features of dreams but we're gonna try to see how this stage of sleep might also have a memory function now importantly during the REM stage the hippocampal circuit here the hippocampal system is not talking to the cortex here right rather it's brainstem uh, neurons are sending signals up to the cortex driving that end to the hippocampus and Tononi and others argue that during this stage what the brainstem activity is doing is helping the cortical memory system integrate new information with previously learned information and we'll call that synaptic consolidation you know LTP up here in the, in the cortex and let's let's take a look at what was happening during that consolidation you'll notice the blue uh, lines here would kind of represent here's like one neuron here's another another three cortical neurons and maybe they're linked by axons and we got synapses here so this is going to be some kind of little memory being formed uh, from the uh, from the hippocampal uh, transfer here and that's in blue and the idea is during REM sleep this uh, brainstem activity sending signals up to the cortex what it what it helps to do is take that newly learned memory in blue here and integrate it with previous uh, information so the idea is the brainstem activity would be activating not only the new memories but also things that might be associated with it or related to the new information in this way we can add new information to our long-term memory system and so we're going to be integrating new information into our memory now meanwhile down in the hippocampus the idea is is that those synapses that were not really involved in anything real important but did undergo some LTP are going to be weakened we're calling that here synaptic renormalization he calls it down selection however some of the ones that were importantly involved in some uh, learning event uh, may be weakened to some extent but not as much as the others and so they in a sense survive the renormalization and so they can be replayed again on successive nights right so the really important stuff is going to is going to be uh, maintained here the synapses will be strengthened for perhaps several days uh, so that the system consolidation could be occurring um, over successive nights Ultimately, though, those synapses, too, over time, will be renormalized. And what's the function of that whole uh, weakening here, and this is the key part of the synaptic homeostasis hypothesis, is that you have to weaken your hippocampal synapses so that they can be ready to learn again, right? Since there is a ceiling effect, there's a limit to how much you can strengthen a synapse, uh, if learning involves strengthening synapses, at some point you're going to have to reset the system to weaken those synapses so they can be ready again. Now, while the hippocampal synapses get weakened for new learning, meanwhile, up in the cortex, the memory is now well consolidated. So here, the LTP is long-lasting, and so that that memory uh, is um, is a long-term memory the hippocampal system is ready to go with new learning its synapses have been weakened by this process also one final thing notice uh, for the slow wave sleep here uh, the amplitude on successive stages of slow wave sleep is s is a smaller amplitude let's compare that to the other one up here large amplitude so the the slow wave sleep 
the first stage of the night tends to have the largest amplitude. And Tononi argues that's because the neurons involved uh, underwent uh, LTP during a whole um, day of learning about stuff, right? So when uh, neurons have had LTP happening all over the cortex and in the hippocampus, uh, the resulting first stage of slow wave sleep has large amplitude um, uh, pattern because those uh, synapses are strong and easy information transfer from cell to cell. But as the synaptic weakening occurs, then the amplitude of the slow wave sleep gets smaller uh, throughout the course of the night. And that is reflecting the fact that the synapses, um, both in the hippocampus but also up in the cortex where the EEG is being um, uh, recorded from, those synapses are being weakened so that they could be uh, strengthened again uh, for some new learning episode. And remember, the ones that do get weakened up here are the ones that weren't really uh, sort of involved in anything real important, but that did get uh, did get some activity during the course of, of a day. Uh, the ones that are maintained uh, represent the important information that we store in long-term memory. So in summary then, um, Tononi and other teams argue that uh, going through these sleep stages uh, s carries with it um, an important memory function. Uh, as the brain shifts in processing modes, the shifts in processing modes are helping the brain to consolidate important information and integrate. And the consolidation, the system consolidation, seems to be occurring uh, in the slow wave sleep portion, uh, while the uh, integration of information may be uh, happening during the REM stage, all the while throughout the night, synapses are being renormalized, both in the hippocampus and in the cortex. So as a result, uh, only those synapses that were strengthened, uh, that, that carried, you know, sort of important information uh, would be, uh, would remain uh, strong uh, while the rest of the synapses would be weakened. In a sense, you want to sort of weaken the noise um, relative to the signal. So this weakening process improves the signal to noise ratio. Uh, the important stuff remains, but the incidental, not non-important uh, synaptic changes are eliminated and that prepares the brain to learn again. So again, sleep is the price we pay for synaptic plasticity. If you're going to have a brain that can learn on repeated days, you have to have a way to reset the synapses so they can be ready to be increased again uh, on a successive learning uh, opportunity.